resumes and what you need to do, I'm going to use yours. This is actually okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, thank you. Good job. We're going to fix this. Okay. You and I will fix this. All right. Because uh, on further review, it's pretty bad. <laughs> it's formatted correctly, okay? And that's that there are certain groupings. What, what do you guys think is the primary purpose of the resume? That is an open question for anyone. It is victim or volunteer with Brian, because if you don't speak up, I will call on you. Jay Neal? Uh, it's to basically for me, like, what value have you brought so far in whatever, whatever companies you work for, and what's the bottom line? Like, why should we employ you? What benefit are you going to bring to us? To get you to an interview. Right. To get you to an interview. That is the primary purpose of a resume, is to get your foot in the door. Right? And uh, you guys see a lot of resumes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know that uh, Ian, you have, and Mike has. What do you think the primary problem for a resume is? Typos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What are the primary problems? Problems. Problems. We're going to have that you see in resumes. Anyway. Nothing quantifiable. Nothing quantifiable. Right. And what do we mean by that? In other words, you don't see dollar amounts that the person has brought in in revenue or percentages of change in revenue or income, whatever, or savings. Right. Now, one of the biggest problems that I see in resumes is they are not well thought out. They don't focus on the job that you're trying to get. Um, I have been looking at a lot of resumes recently, and a lot of the issues that I see is they're unfocused. It doesn't look like you're applying for the position that is being advertised. And since, by and large, we are not using cover letters anymore, the only thing to get you in the door is a really good resume. And uh, I spend a lot of time looking at them, and I go, this person doesn't have what we're looking for. And we don't advertise or, or promote to look for people that are golden unicorns or purple squirrels or, or those um, everything, because we know better. And I find that a lot of the issues are that they just don't, it's not, it doesn't look like a fit from the resume that we right. received. So those are great answers. And in fact, that is, here's is one of the things I want to hit on. The biggest problem for Brian Sullivan sees in resumes is you are grossly underselling yourself. Grossly underselling yourself. So, Jay Neal, you and I went through an exercise the last, what, week? Yep. With your resume. And some stuff that he, he has done through the process of updating his resume, we went through like three. Yeah. Three versions of it. He was on a project that uh, he shot video and he created documentation for some uh, open source uh, programs. And a lot of it, and it's being accessed globally, different languages, different countries. And he's the main guy that worked on that project. The way that it looked on his resume was, I shot video for this open source project. Grossly underselling himself. Grossly, right? We flesh that out a little bit more to where now he looks like a badass. <laughs> and he has a story that he can tell to market himself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so the story, though, we had to tweak it a little bit. And the way that we tweaked that was exactly what was your name? Greg. Greg. It's exactly what Greg said. And we had to put some numbers around it, right? And so it's not that he just produced videos, it's he produced like 80 videos over the course of a year, seen in 25 countries. Just having those little numbers, uh, people's eyes went to it. Then, how does it affect the bottom line, which is, Greg, when you affect the bottom line, what do you do? Hopefully you get hired. Hopefully you get hired, but you're either generating revenue or saving something, right? So if you can say that, 
here's a crazy bullet point on my resume from years ago. Uh, ran a special project where I saved the company $10 million. Uh, and it was looking at uh, the contracts that were expired. I'm going to tell you guys, worst effing project ever. But the bottom line is it saved the company $10 million year over year. Big number, right? And I can talk about the project. Okay? So you've got to be able to have those types of stories to position yourself when you're building out your resume. So I saw a resume, and it's not this one. But I saw a resume, and it was by a student. She brings it to me, and the resume is kind of her duties. I'm an office manager at such and such. These are the things that I do as an office manager. Create the schedule, manage blah, 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 order office supplies, blah, blah, blah. It's junk. Correct? People care about really what you do? No. What do they care about? They want to know about your accomplishments. Your bottom line accomplishments. How did you affect the bottom line? How did you save the company money? Or how did you make money with whatever it is that you did? Does that make sense? You've got to be able to craft that story. That's my fun. Okay? You guys, though, what, what are the things that you see in resumes that are wanted? To what you were saying, I think it. Um, to not, <laughs> there's so many subjective elements to a resume, um, especially if you're a designer, they'll, they'll, one employer likes to see something fancy that you may have built, or they just want to see the black and white. And so it's, it is subjective a lot, which can be very challenging. But I think also in addition to what Brian was saying, I kept hearing bullet points telling a story. You want to tell that story and be able to sell yourself and market yourself, but it needs to be concise and focused. Um, and you know, especially if it's if you're giving it to a recruiter or a hiring manager, they're not going to want to read everything and and have it be in first person. It needs to be bullet point and very exact, so things will stick out to that person that is hiring. The other thing that you're going to want to do, Danielle, you went through this, right? So we went through a cycle where we updated your resume, and one of the last things I said is, okay, this looks like it's finalized, and he goes, yes, and I said, awesome, you now need to update LinkedIn, right, so LinkedIn should be mimicking your resume to a certain extent, and, you know, the last thing you want to do, don't lie on your resume, because it's such a small world out there, and people will find out that you get a bad reputation, but if it's mismatching what you're sending out, LinkedIn mismatches, that leads to just question marks. Does that make sense? Right? Well, along the lines of what um, Brian was saying, you know, the, the bullet point about $10 million. I mean, you want to tell a story, but you also want to dangle some carrots out there. So if they want to ask, well, you say $10 million, well, tell me about this. You know, you just kind of want to intrigue them enough to, you know, with bullet points or, or with that ROI, return on investment, like I saved money or I... I created efficiencies or you know brought value in some way shape or form but to be able to to put something um, some facts out there people like come on tell me a little bit more about this this sounds intriguing I mean this is a huge accomplishment it sounds like you know so you're really you don't want the the resume to, to speak for itself to where it tells the entire story you want to tell enough of the story so they want to hear more from you um, that's that's really key right and then, uh, that leads into a portfolio usually some cool story or some artifacts. Do you have a question? Or I just had a comment mind? if I could. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, when somebody looks at your resume, they literally look at it for five to ten seconds. That's it. It's right. just like a website. They look at it, they're seeing the main bullet points, and they're moving on. They can read the whole thing. Because they've got a lot of resumes to go through. Would you agree with that? Yeah. A lot of times, what happens, and again, we're just getting into like corporate. America, uh, which leads into the next section. Uh, I call it a T-style resume, right? So there are going to be key words in the job description, and some of those words need to show up in your resume. If they don't, uh, sometimes you just have a job bank filter, right? And you're all automatically filtered out because you don't really have good SEO. 
right? Uh, hiring managers have been looking at that forever. SEO is nothing new, right? They just filtered it out differently. So look at the key words within the job description and the skills. Make sure that it's a good match for you. You are also interviewing the company that you're going to work with, so think about that. It needs to be a good match. Uh, so sometimes it's that first filter is going to be an automated filter, or it might be an HR person that doesn't have a clue about uh, web design, usability, content, writing, you name it. They don't, they don't know. So they're just, okay, well, what are the keywords? Okay, this match. I'm going to give you a call, ask you some generic questions. Does this sound like a reasonably intelligent person? Cool. Then we're going to pass it over into a stack of resumes. And then at a certain point in time, you're going to come in and the person may not have even looked at your resume. They're looking at it for the first time in a job interview. Okay. So now I want to talk to you a little bit. Again, I'm only going to talk about five more minutes and I'm going to split. Okay. <laughs> but um, the strategy that I want you to take away with is you need to be fully prepared for that next job interview, whatever it is. If you walk into a room with one person, you've got talking points. And these guys are experts. They can tell you how to do that. To sell yourself, if that's really the company that you want it. And you have artifacts, which will be in your portfolio. And if you walk into a room with one person, that's a conversation. If you walk into a room with four people, let me, let me show you exactly what I do. Okay. I will say, it's so good to meet you. Here's my resume, here's my resume, here's my resume. And then the first person starts to ask questions. And I go, that's fantastic. Let me show you this. And they start going through your portfolio, or I hand it. And then I've already split the room in two, because that person will look at the portfolio and not focus on these two people. Eye to eye contact, right? That person will ask a question because they can't look at the portfolio, so you can then have a one-on-one, -on -one, right? And then they'll pass the portfolio. And if you really are interested and you got all of them going, you take the portfolio. Let me show you this. Oh, well, this is in my advertising section of my portfolio. And I might have it. It might either be on an iPad, right? And they may have looked at the portfolio ahead of time. So that, that again, you got to be prepared for all of that. Sometimes it's printed, sometimes it's online with an iPad, and you got to be ready for that. Okay. And what I'll say is, and this is a, for someone like Mike, someone like Ian, the skills that you'll learn doing this is actually the same skills that you will learn to get a client to sign a contract for you, because you're selling yourself with that contract. And so these skills that you'll learn today transition beautifully into getting someone to sign a contract for the business. Okay? Your resume is only your first step. And as you learned over the last few days, it took a couple of days to get your story <coughs> right with your resume. I have not seen your portfolio. That's what these people are going to do. Okay. So, uh, you guys have any questions for me? I'm just giving you world according to Brian. Any questions or comments? Okay. Who feels like their resume is awesome? Yeah, Ian's this because he's going to. He's an expert. You got a good resume. Awesome. Can I see it? <laughs> no, uh, what I like to do is uh, resumes that are really good, I keep uh, handy. And so what I did with Jay Neal is I go, check this one out. And I gave him a selection of like three. And he was able to mimic that quickly. He did a great job, but it still took three or four iterations of that. But if you don't have a good resume, I uh, hope these tips and tricks help you. And uh, these guys are more than willing to help you with uh, resumes, so get your business card. And uh, you can also talk to me and I can shoot it over to people. What I do want to do is uh, introduce you. Are you the main speaker today? Yes. Well, it's my turn. 
<laughs> yes, he is. As far as we know. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> so what, this is going to be an interactive session, right? So very similar to what I did. Uh, we're going to talk. You're going to see. This is a, a Sue line from the Creative Group, and he's going to go through a presentation. And it's again how to create your portfolio and, and pitch, how to sell your stuff, right? And uh, that's going to last 30 minutes or so. Sure. Depends, on how, it, so. depends on how interactive it is. <laughs> so we do also have a couple of other people that are willing to look at your resume and portfolios today. And uh, so uh, we have three of them on your team. We have Shauna and Shirley. Yeah, Shauna and Shirley. Shauna. <laughs> No. Shirley, Michael, Vaughn, yeah. Ian, Finn, Fluin, from where? London. London, just for you guys. <laughs> cool. Seriously, just for you guys. Uh, Elisa Miller, she's in the back. Right. They all have uh, different specialties also. So if you really are motivated, you'll circulate it among all of them. And. Uh, this guy right here, I have so much respect for him. Uh, he talks to really big brands, really big companies. And so when it comes to like big brands, big companies, what they're looking for, he's going to do that fabulous for you. Uh, Shirley and uh, Shauna focus in on the Dallas market, so they know where the jobs are, right? Uh, Michael uh, comes, and Michael and Ian are more of a, from a consultant's perspective, and then uh, Elisa is more from a professional development perspective, and then you're, what's your role at USBA? Professional development, I have, I'm on the board as the director of professional development. Director of professional development. And so she can look at it solely from, a, here are things from a professional development perspective, maybe add this, look at this, there's classes here. And also from an enterprise perspective. Definitely from an enterprise perspective. Definitely. Anyway, I got to go back to uh, Big Design. Uh, who all is going to the conference in the next few days? Awesome. Great. So uh, I got to troubleshoot some problems, but thanks for putting this on. I think it's great because all of you that raised your hand, what I would like is that you have a resume and a portfolio that's fresh that uh, you can circulate around. And get connected immediately with these guys. Get the network because the best job comes from the network. And Michael, Elisa, Ian, and these guys can really help you to uh, land that next job. So without further ado, Suwon, take it away. Thanks. Thank you. All right, how's everyone doing? Good. All right. So this is just so you know. I think there's a couple in here that have been to this presentation before, uh, or a similar presentation, and so. It was kind of interesting because when you take a look at portfolios, it really tells people a lot about you. Uh, it tells you a lot about uh, maybe what you bring to the table or what you don't bring to the table or maybe what uh, you know, kind of gets what you think is interesting and what you think is cool. So it was interesting that uh, you know TCG, the creative group, being a you know the largest firm in the country that specializes in creative marketing placement had a outdated PowerPoint presentation about portfolios. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if you'd seen a lot, uh, if you'd seen older presentations, you would know that this is that what it used to be in PowerPoint. Uh, so, because we pretty much kind of brought more and more about it, we actually created a new one. So. This is actually the first time that anyone will have seen this presentation. Obviously, I'm not Diane Delmeyer. I'm not the executive director of the creative group. But uh, this presentation has, has been shown at the How Conference. Outside of that, this is essentially the first time that this presentation has ever been used. It's in a Prezi format. So uh, I will say that it, it, we will utilize it very interactively. It's not you know me listening to myself for a while just doesn't go over very well. So we'll kind of walk through this. So really quickly, though, <coughs> portfolio. Who who here has por has a portfolio? Okay. Who here has a por everyone has a portfolio? Okay. So um, what what exactly is a portfolio for? Anyone? What's, what's a portfolio for? Showing off your work. Okay. Yes. Maybe more about 
telling a story. And okay. I think that's where people make their mistakes is um, just thinking it's a place to keep samples. And uh, what you really want to do is use that portfolio to tell a story. Right. Okay. So there's a few things we want to talk about. Is one is why our portfolio is so important. Uh, second thing we want to talk about is what are hiring managers looking for, especially in you know we have the portfolio here that says hello I'm totally outdated. Um, you know, kind of the briefcase looking type of portfolio, kind of like the PowerPoint type of presentation as well, even though, you know, we still do use them a lot. But what are other designers? Third thing, what are other designers? Uh, how do they land work with their portfolio? You know, because, you know, as Brian was saying, looking at other people's resumes helps us to kind of formulate a resume that is best suited for us and helps us to land work. We want to look at other people's portfolios and how they're using utilizing that to land work. And then fourthly is how to actually present. You know, Brian kind of gave a little bit of, okay, so we're going to utilize the resume, and we're going to divide up the room, give us an ability to have a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but we do want to have a better idea of how to actually present the portfolio to make sure that we do land the work. So um, this isn't really anything that anyone in this room, I would imagine, is going to take as a surprise that you know, the black, the days of the black portfolio where you come in, you pull out all the pieces, whether POPs or, you know, marketing collateral or brochures or business cards or, you know, uh, that's outdated. Okay. Pretty much everybody these days really has something that is digital in nature, whether it's something on, on your laptop or on your, power, uh, or on your iPad or, or your tablet. But everyone these days has something that is more digital in nature. So, um, so the question though is, is when you look at the digital portfolio, there's a lot of digital portfolios, and the single most part of looking for your job is the portfolio. A lot of people, actually, there are recruiters in Denver and, and in Seattle, and even Shirley and Shauna will will say that there's a lot of people out there, designers, who will be able to land their next opportunity just off the portfolio. Forget the resume, forget the LinkedIn, forget the whatever. But the portfolio alone will help them to be able to, to land uh, land an opportunity. But there's a lot out there. I mean, if you've ever been to Behance, if you've ever been to Chlorophyll, if you've ever been to any of those uh, landing pages or portfolio destination sites, there's a lot of portfolios out there. So the question then becomes is, you know, how do you get noticed amongst all those people, right? Because if they're looking at, and I don't know how many, if you were to search up, you know, maybe you did a keyword search on Chlorophyll or Behance locally in Dallas and put Dallas or, you know, certain types of keywords, how many people would show up? But it would be a tremendous amount of people. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we find a way to actually get the portfolio noticed. So there's a couple of things on here. What do you guys think? What are some things that you guys do to your portfolio to help it get noticed? <clears throat> Your perspective. Something unique in your portfolio. Anybody. Give it a reason why you created it. A reason why you created it? Okay. What else? What kind of the uh, thought process of maybe one behind the project? So the, almost a before mm -hmm. and an after, but not just showing the work, but explaining it a little bit. Right. Context. A little bit of context, a little bit story. Uh, so why don't we actually take a look at this for a second, uh, which is your, your digital portfolio really comes down to, if you want to get noticed, uh, look at that. Okay. So if you want to get noticed, there's a few things that you probably need to do. And as I mentioned that, you know, the, the digital portfolio is your first impression. So a lot of times when you're submitting a resume or you're submitting something, having communication with a potential employer, you're submitting a link or something possibly, or maybe you're going through, you open up your laptop, you have your iPad there, you're going through your portfolio. That's their first impression of you in terms of what you can do for them, right? So it gets, this gets beyond just the resume. This gets beyond you know, your personal appearance on how you come in walking into the interview, but this gets into the meat of, okay, so this is something visual that I can see of what they can do for me, for the company, and for my department, my area. So this first thing, a couple things that you want to take a look at is you want to take a look at is 
simple navigation. Okay, <coughs> if you look at it from the standpoint is is getting to getting to the site, to the portfolio site, and you kind of look at it and you go, okay, is it simple to navigate? I don't know if you, Shauna, if you've ever seen a, you know, the portfolios that are kind of like really hard. Yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on? Well, I don't know where to go to look at the work, um, and if and if and if you can't showcase that in your portfolio, then how can we expect a hiring manager to hire you to help create a better user experience on their site? If you can't brand yourself that way, <coughs> that's I mean that's where I go. And so a couple things is if it's difficult there, they're thinking about okay their website. You're going to do their website or their collateral, and, and if it's and if your portfolio is confusing, they're feeling like you're going to communicate their brand message or their design confusing. So uh, simple navigation reflects your personal brands. You know, so one thing that you want to make sure that you do is you want to make sure that you have pieces that reflect you, uh, reflect your personality. Something that because creativity, when you look at creativity, is something that you're passionate about. If you've ever tried to design something that you really kind of don't care about, has anyone ever tried to do that? You design something that you really don't care. What was it? What was it like? Awful. Awful. Why? Why was it awful? It just doesn't flow naturally. Mm -hmm. so you're making up things and figuring things out, and they don't click, and you're just going through process rather than creativity. Exactly. If you have passion about it, you pour more into it. And people can actually see, and a lot of times they can uh, extract out the emotion or that passion that you're putting into the work. And so you have to be able to portray a little bit of your personal brand preferences or your personal style so they can have an idea of what it is that you're going to be passionate about. Short, concise descriptions. So Brian had talked about bullet point format on your resume, but at the same time, you know, if you've ever been to a site and you have, you know, the UI on the site is just intensely textual and a lot of content, content on the website, it becomes very difficult to, to understand where your eye needs to move, what you need to look at, what you need to really hone in on. And it's the same thing with your digital portfolio too. You need to have very short, concise descriptions to make sure that people can actually get through those and understand those very clearly. So, any other questions just about that in general? So that's just kind of a short piece on, on the portfolio as a whole. So, next question is, is, what are hiring managers like? What are they like? And second one was, what do they love? So, anyone who's in hiring, what, what are some things that you guys like? And Michael, what do you guys what do you guys like? Or like you guys... Yes. I like to see that that whole process of the role you played in the project, what your thinking was as a part of that project. Uh, do you look at things strategically? Do you look at them tactically? I expect you to be able to tell me a story with what it is that you have in your portfolio, particularly for an interactive designer or someone like. Uh, that's actually doing that level of design work. I like to see a wireframe. I like to see an interactive actor or something that includes some of the interaction. And then I like to see a possible finished product because that helps me see where the iteration went, how it was interpreted by the developers and so forth. Um, if you're a usability person, uh, I like to see things like your screener. What does that look like? Uh, who are you looking for? What kind of questions do you ask as a, as a part of the process of conducting usability? <clears throat> what does your end report look like? And I don't need to see every page. I just want a sense of what problem you were trying to solve and the process that you went through to try to solve it. Yes. I'm just going to echo that too. I mean, for me, I like seeing a really good story. And then I also like to see that you put as much passion into your work and put it together for portfolio. Right. So that's an example of what you're going to do for me. Right. Exactly. And I find that passion often comes out in the interview process when they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. Because you can tell which projects really engage those folks. Because they get more excited when they start talking about it. Um, if they just sort of walk you through the steps, I always ask, you know, was this a difficult project? Because, face it, we do not all have perfect projects and we don't have perfect teams. And that leads me to be able, 
as a hiring manager to ask questions about uh, how did that process go, what were the challenges of that project, how did you handle those challenges, <coughs> and you could really explore more into what we call behavioral interviewing and get to understand how these people approach what it is that they do. And perfection matters too. Man, it's um, perfection matters as far as the resume is. It's got to be perfect as far as the make sure you don't have any grammar errors. And if you are like a copywriter or designer, but you don't have the design skills, or you're a designer not the copywriter skill, you got to have somebody that's done copywriter to look at that and make sure that's perfect too. Right. So it's got to be buttoned up. And I think a lot of times what we want to take a look at is, is we are trying to communicate a relevant story to them. Um, you know, it's, it needs to be a relevant story that demonstrates impact, how you can impact their business or you know their department or their company. So, uh, but so when we took a look at it, you know, Alan Peters, an associate creative director for Target, uh, he said, make sure your first project is either killer or else a collection of your greatest hits, you know? Uh, you know, if you always take a look at it, you know, I've seen some portfolios and you flip through them and they're like, you know, 50 miles deep and you're kind of scrolling through them, scrolling through them, scrolling through them. And every piece in there is kind of like, it's okay, it's okay, you know, I've seen them before, it's okay. And then you get to the very, very bottom and you're like, now that's a pretty cool piece, you know? But, <laughs> but most employers will never get to the bottom. They will stop somewhere at the top. So, you know, and, and uh, if you have multiple projects, just make sure that the first one that's there is the one that you feel is going to attract the most attention. You know, it's kind of like when we get to the to the resume, and we said, how long do we will will an employer look at the, the resume? Eight to ten seconds, right? So, how long do you think a potential employer is going to look at your portfolio? Yeah, it's, it's a little longer. Statistics say it's about twenty seconds. You know, you have twenty seconds to capture their attention. And if you haven't captured their attention within 20 seconds, they're either going to move on to the next portfolio of the 100 some resumes and portfolios they have, or they're going to go on and look at something deeper. So, uh, so a couple things on here. Uh, the portfolios, uh, if you want to take a look, let's see, greatest, you want to take a look at it from a greatest hits approach. You know, take a look at it from the perspective of, I kind of moved up pretty quick. But someone who's going to put something, put pieces on here that they think are their greatest pieces, they think are their greatest projects, the ones that are going to grab your attention the most. Um, and you want to make the layout something that's going to also be easily navigated so you can get to those projects uh, very simplistically. And the other thing I would tell you on this is, is you know, we've seen these, is when you go through the, the project and you put on a piece of work and it takes you forever to figure out how to get back. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing with the usability of your site uh, to make sure that if you're going to have multiple projects and multiple pieces that you can expand and you can go into detail, maybe blow up on, make sure it's easy to get back to the home page because there's nothing more frustrating than looking at a portfolio that's complex to navigate from a circular perspective. So, um, Make sure you also uh, make sure that not only the layout is clean, the layout is good, but also the colors are also attractive and appealing. The designs itself that you put on there. So, okay, uh, Alan Peters again. Keep it simple, like an art gallery, all white and easy to uh, all white and easy to navigate. So uh, we just want to make sure that the art that you're putting on there is something that's going to be appealing, not not necessarily. As you say, convoluted, complex, or confusing. So something simple like this, if you're going to have like a project, easy to read, simplistic. Kind of just going through different pieces and different things, so you can kind of see again different uh, different styles of, of uh, portfolios of what people have done. So Anne Willoughby, founder and chief officer of Willoughby, uh, what is uh, what is your take on this? Beautiful work by itself may not interest us if there's not a story behind it. You know, we've been talking about that. The piece itself is kind of like it, it's kind of like if you take a picture. There's a whole story behind the picture. So if you have a wireframe 
or if you have an image, a screenshot, but don't really say a lot behind it, it really can be taken out of context, um, either in a good way or in a bad way. And so what are some things that, for example, uh, from a story standpoint, you had mentioned one, making sure that you have the idea of, of you know, the thought process behind it, the creative process, so you can actually see where it came from, where it originated, how you actually did it through the wireframes, the images, and then the site itself, you know, kind of work, working it through. But let's take that a little a step further for a second. You know, think back to the resume when we talked about bullet points, ROI, impact. So if we have a project that we want to paint better context around, um, what are some things that we would also probably want to include in the portfolio to kind of help better paint that on a piece? To be a project. What do you guys think? <clears throat> how would you better explain how this is what that piece means, or why that would be? You know, if you have, say, you built a microsite, or maybe you say you designed um, email campaigns, or maybe you had branding campaigns. What are some things that you could put in your portfolio that would help the the employer, the interviewer? Understand what that did, what that meant to them. Analytics, Analytics? okay. What press else? clippings. Huh? Press clippings, like the project you worked on, like it was popular. So. Okay. Okay. Exposure. Yes. Testimonials. Testimonials. Right. Um, so, what are some typical site analytics things that could measure impact of uh, of of a site? What are some things that normally you mention analytics? So, what kind of analytics? Month to month traffic increases, unique users, and maybe page views. Right. Conversion rates, balance rates. Right. I mean, those are all things that you can include when you're talking about your portfolio, or, you know, and also making sure that, for example, your resume and your portfolio sometimes can be tied together. So, for example, uh, if you have important pieces on your portfolio that you feel are really good, but they're never mentioned on your resume, you know, that might be something that you kind of question, right? So again, your resume is kind of like gets you in the door, then the portfolio kind of helps you bring the life or bring the visualization what it is, and now you want to tell them, say, hey, look, you know, this was the project, this was the company, this was my part in the story. The impact of the story is we increased site traffic by X, we increased conversion by S, we, X, we decreased drops by X, you need users, and, and you can go through that. And now you've created and painted an entire story of how that employer, that company can actually see what you're going to be able to do for them. So does that make sense? Okay. There's a couple other things. Uh, recruiters always look for quality digital portfolios that will help them gauge a cultural fit as well. Because we did talk about that this is, you know, you're interviewing them. So what are some ways that a good cultural fit comes through in your portfolio? <coughs> Right? So, and, and so the next piece is, for example, here. So this is a piece of a person. So tell, let's kind of walk through this whole piece here. What do you guys see as the story behind this piece? What is that? Retro. Retro. Okay, what else? Edgy. Edgy? Okay. <coughs> okay. So we can see here that basically you have, uh, this is an, a designer out of Austin. And so the designer's name is Carl Herbert, uh, and this is actually in his portfolio. But he wanted to uh, include a brief explanation of each project and a little bit of background information on why he kind of created these things. So he wanted to tell a, tell a tale, for example, of a violent car accident that Alice Cuervo uh, was in as a teenager. And so he kind of created the uh, CD in terms of the cover of it that kind of helped allude into what that story is, okay? And so, but as you can see, is this something that, <clears throat> based upon this piece, is it something kind of that he's just, eh, it was a piece, or is this something that you can see that he was passionate about? Yeah, this is something that he kind of holds dear and holds close to him. And that's something that you want to be able to have come out into, in it. You know, and throughout the whole piece that he has different things that he wanted to not only necessarily stay with the same same design, the same standards, but at the same time he wanted to communicate his personality and what 
he likes and what he has passion to do. So, um, and Willoughby also said, a mediocre piece in the portfolio is a red flag. It tells me the designer has not thoughtfully crafted his or her presentation. Why do you guys think that? What do you guys think? So everything, you know, say you got 10 pieces in your portfolio and one of them is a mediocre piece. Why do you think that's a red flag? Right? Okay. Right, right. Or improper placement. Improper placement, right. Okay. Um, so, an advertising and marketing executives that we surveyed, or TCG surveyed, said the biggest misstep creative professionals make when assembling their portfolios is to include samples that don't show value provided, uh, that they provided to the company. That's the biggest mistake that they make. Okay, it's just a piece because I want to have a piece then, you know? So there needs to be some value proposition with the pieces that you put in. Focus on quality over quantity as you edit your portfolio and remove anything that's questionable. You know, have someone look at it. You know, Michael May kind of mentioned, uh, you know, have a copywriter or someone actually who, who does that for a living and, and look at it and give you their opinion of it. You know, it, it's true. It's like, you know, sometimes we think we're, we need to be a lone ranger when it comes to, you know, our job search. Well, no, it's, we need to get together. We need to access the skills that we have in our networks to make sure that we are in the best position. And, and I'll kind of throw this question out. Why is that actually important? It, because it's more, it's, it goes beyond just presenting a good portfolio. But if you're leveraging your network to make sure that your portfolio is the best piece that it can possibly be, how would that help you down the road if, per se, they hired you? How does that help you? Bring other people on board. Well, bringing other people on board, but it... But it also kind of puts you in a position where if you're in that company and they have a project, if you always feel like everything's sitting on you, but you're not an expert in this, you're not an expert in this. I know one thing that I, first thing that I do is I pick up the phone or I go through my email, uh, you know, my contacts and I say, hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about this? So it's more or less a, an opportunity that you have to kind of just get in the mode of always accessing the best resources you have around you. You know, so you run you run into that project that is maybe it's a little over your head, but it's still your project. So what do we do? We can't just say, well, okay, this is a little over my head. I'm not sure what I can do. You know, maybe what we do is we go to Brian Sullivan. <laughs> Maybe we go to other people within the network though and say, hey, you know, what do you know about this technology? I remember uh, you know, getting a, an opportunity with a company for a developer, a consultant in Sitecore. I didn't know a whole lot about Sitecore. You know? So you know, I picked up the phone, made a few phone calls to, to a point where at least I could speak educated about Sitecore. I knew what companies were probably implemented, I knew what size they were, I knew typically why they made those types of types of implementations, you know, those types of things. And then you can speak at a higher level with consultants and then as you'll find, as you do better networking, it actually just gets you engaged to always tap the best resources. So again, it, it, you always want to make sure that you're tapping people to make sure you have the best pieces all the way, all the way across the board. So a couple of other things, you know, what's in a name? These are, just so you know, these are kind of not so good examples. So that way you can kind of take a look and kind of see, oh, all right. Um, these are things that maybe you would take a look at and go, uh, maybe I should cut those out from my portfolio. Because again, if it's kind of on the borderline, we want to make sure that you, you remove them. Okay. Tommy Sheehan, uh, design director at LPK, uh, what are you doing outside of the workplace? I'm always looking to see what designers are really passionate about. Why is that important? Okay. Anyone else? Tone. What is that? Tone. Tone. Okay. I remember sitting in an interview with um, with Tom Matthews, uh, and Tom Matthews is the 
uh, global director for uh, digital products at UT Southwestern, and and he goes through the the you know kind of the whole same thing. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about projects and stuff like that. And then he really starts getting the questions like, so what kind of sites do you go to to keep yourself up to date with of, you know with, with the interactive friends? You know, where do you go to educate yourself? What kind of sites do you learn from? You know, and, and it's kind of interesting when you get some people who have a portfolio that is um, cutting edge. They always have an answer, and they will always have sites. And it's kind of interesting. They'll always have sites that you're like, oh, I've never heard of that site. <laughs> you know, and then you have other people who really have never even bothered to have sites. Or have resources. You know, he asked about books. He asks asks about uh, you know people. He asks about networking resources uh, or meetup groups that they use to keep themselves up to up to pace uh, and and knowing the most up current technology, the current trends in design, where things are going. But he definitely hits a lot on that. So. Uh, so even though uh, this is a this is a uh, portfolio by the guy by the name of Tommy Sheehan, uh, that's actually his portfolio. So even though he's happily employed, one of the things he does is on the side is he always keeps his portfolio up to date. It doesn't matter, you know. He's like, I'm not looking, but you know, I'm gonna make sure that I keep my portfolio up to date. Why do you think he does that? You never know when the job ends. <laughs> you never know when the job ends, right? Okay, what else? Right. Okay. What else? Keeps him sharp. He's always thinking about the future. Keeps him sharp. Project. So now, one thing that I was, what, what I thought was kind of interesting is, is do you think all those pieces are from his current employer? May or may not be. May or not. May not be. There are some pieces that are actually on his portfolio site that are actually just projects he does for fun. Just to keep his skills sharp, because think about that. If you work for a company and you uh, have your your entire portfolio is reliant upon pieces that you did at that company for say I don't know maybe two, three, five years, okay, and then you leave and then all of a sudden you find out that you can't use them because of copyright infringement or because you, know, you just can't show the piece. Now where now where are you left? You, you, Kind of in a tough spot, right? <laughs> and so now you're caught behind two things. You're caught behind trying to find an engagement or find an opportunity, whether it's a project or a full time employer. But now you actually have to find some pieces that you can put on it that are relevant, that are current, that are trendy. And, you know, Shirley, Sean, you guys can actually attest to it. How many portfolios do you guys see that has dated work? Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, you know they have better work. You do. No, they've done it. Yeah. No, they're skilled. Oh, I haven't had they time. Just, you know, you're your own worst critic and your own yeah. worst client. You yeah. know. Mm -hmm. So. So, but that's one of the things that he does. Is Tommy makes sure that he does just side projects on the side for himself. You know, maybe for friends or whatever. But and then he can update his portfolio and he can always have new, fresh, clean pieces that he likes that he's passionate about. So, Tommy Sheehan said, uh, minor uh, iterations of the same thing annoy me. Pick the one that truly that you truly like and show it. So, have you guys ever seen that? Have you seen the same website and it's the same website? And Ten pages later, it's the same website. <laughs> you know, or it's the same marketing collateral piece and it's the same thing. So, make sure you pick the one that you like. Don't have to go into you know scenarios and situations where you know like here it's it's really the same piece it's different colors maybe different pages in the same brochure but it's the same piece so I can tell if you did your research and crafted it for my eyes why is that important? Know who your audience is. Know who your audience is. Okay, this is by Andy Kurtz, uh, design manager for Fresh Market. So, you know, 
How can that help you if you crafted your portfolio specifically for him or for the person you're interviewing? Well, the work would be relevant for whatever they're right. looking for. So you're producing the person with them, right? Right. If, if you go into an interview with Pepsi, you probably don't want any Coke pieces on there, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, if you're going into a conservative, uh, conservative environment, you probably don't want, you know, pieces that would not fit into a conservative company or vice versa. Uh, if you're going into extremely trendy, uh, you know, innovative company, you probably don't want uh, a lot of pieces that say, you know, uh, sale and monotone, right? Uh, so it also shows that you just put a lot of forethought into things. Um, says that you actually cared enough to make sure that your sample and your portfolio meets them. So these two PDFs might look like job applications from two different designers, but they're actually both from a designer, uh, from that designer, Timothy. Okay, so it's kind of an example of, of him crafting a resume portfolio for one person or one employer, but an entirely different one for a different employer. You know, so every time you send it out, it shouldn't just be like, oh, click, uh, send this off. You know, you really need to take the time to customize it based upon a little bit of research. You know, it's very easy. You know, one of the first things that we always do is if I'm talking to somebody on the phone with a company, so I might be, say, for example, I'm talking to Sears, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking with, uh, you know, the design director for New Store Innovations. Okay, first thing I'm doing while I'm on the phone with him is I'm looking him up in, in, the, uh, in LinkedIn. That's the first thing I'm doing. Because I want to get a little bit of a glimpse of the background of who he is, where did he come from, is he new to kind of that retail space, does he come from a small organization, you know, what, what is his background, because then I can speak a little bit more relevant to his background versus not having an idea. So this is just an example of, of him actually making sure that the piece is, is actually relevant to specifically who he's interviewing with. Um, one's app, app, applicant's logo, one applicant's logo was an ink drawing of his face with a bunch of piercings. Okay. Um, So, you know, 52% of executives we interviewed said that they found gimmicky job hunting tactics, uh, such as potential employers, to uh, as unprofessional. Okay, I, I mean, it's just we might think it's kind of funny and it might be kind of humorous, but you know, naturally, sometimes and we see them, right? What, what are some things that we kind of see on portfolios, or maybe we see on resumes? Um, just recently. <laughs> He's very young, so um, I thought it was funny, but got to coach him one uh, recently. Huh? Green. Very green. <laughs> uh, his so when his portfolio is up on the screen and the brown <clears throat> and the tab, the title is "Pardon Me, Stephen Shit." <laughs> and so I mean that may I mean it's funny, ha uh ha, -huh, and maybe but not you know if you're going to be sending it and, and an agency might find that fun and all that, but I think if you're sending it to um, more corporate environment or something like that, I don't think that they would find that too funny. Yeah. yeah. It, I don't know how many resumes from portfolio you see with like the personal pictures of himself or you know things like that. So um, it's just, it's again, it all comes back to customizing the portfolio for, for the audience. So design words of wisdom um, or how to stop freaking out. So sometimes, you know, one of the things about portfolios, it, it does, it's, it's a stressful thing. But naturally, we want to make sure that that uh, it's not something uh, that I guess we get too stressed out about. But uh, don't fall into the trap of waiting until you have one or more logo uh, to you know to uh, start building a project or a portfolio of logos. Make sure that you don't have just one piece. When you you know if you just have one piece, don't wait until you uh, get too much. Make sure you actually have um, good pieces to go in the portfolio. Uh, this is from Carl Hebert. He's a graphics designer of McGarrett Jesse. And again, so 
McGarry Jesse, do you think most of the stuff that he designs is going to be under under IP or intellectual property? That you'll be able to, yes, it will. So um, think about your portfolio ahead of time. Think about your career progression ahead of time. Think about the pieces that you have. Think about how they're going to help you, how they're going to progress with you. So don't just make sure that you uh, you know have pieces that, for example, may get blocked, but it's kind of just an example of different pieces. So um, you have different formats, so it's not necessarily a bad thing to have like a core flat or a Behance, but just make sure that, for example, on Behance, the platform that uh, showcasing and discovering creative work, uh, there are other good options. There are uh, that are for, you know, the Behance I think is HTML, is that right? So um, it's uh, learn about HTML or CSS in order to build portfolios. There are other ones that don't necessarily require as much uh, technical knowledge, uh, such as uh, Squarespace and, Scar and Cargo. Uh, those are a couple of different options outside of Squarespace and like a responsive. Mm -hmm. So if you're not technically savvy, you can use those. Okay. Um, and the big thing is just get in the habit of keeping your portfolio updated at all times. Just make sure that you always are working on it. Um, you know, and it doesn't always necessarily have to be something that's corporate. Again, it's it's something that's you're passionate about. Always do projects that you have. Either you can do them for friends, you can do them for you know, like, was that pro, pro bono? You can do them a lot of different things in different ways. But just make sure that you're constantly working on them. So, um, so if you're door Presenting it in person, so let's talk about that for just a little bit. What do you guys think are some helpful hints about presenting your portfolio when you're in person? What are some, <coughs> I guess, do's and don'ts that you think of? Rehearse it. Rehearse it? Okay. What else? Have good stories to tell. Have good stories to tell. Okay. I'm going to throw one other one out at you that I want all of you to think about. Because in an interview situation, one of the hardest things to do is to tolerate silence. And I will tell you this from many years of experience of interviewing people. And sometimes what you need to do, particularly when you're showing your portfolio, is to explain something, tell the story, and then let the person actually look. And it may get really uncomfortable to you when they're looking, and you're not saying anything, and they are not saying anything. That's okay. You need to learn to tolerate that <clears throat> silence because they may be formulating a question either about something that they're seeing or something that you said, and the same holds true when they ask you a question. You may want to give it a minute of thought before you rush in to answer. And it is the most uncomfortable part of any interview process is that silence. Oftentimes, one of you will just rush into either asking a question or answering a question simply because they're uncomfortable with silence. So you have to keep saying to yourself, give them five seconds, ten seconds, thirty seconds to look at your portfolio before they may actually formulate a question that they want to ask. And it's probably the hardest thing to learn in this whole process. And um, that's one thing I'm just want to make clear. Silence is very hard. <laughs> That is extremely difficult. It's what, very hard. You know, thing about music, I mean, silence is actually used to project peace. You can kind of approach it from that point. So there's a couple things on this that we want to think about. Is how you handle yourself in the interview also gives them an insight of how you will handle yourself in a business meeting. Okay. It also gives them insight on how you will handle yourself in front of the clients. Okay. Designers need to do a couple of things that are actually important. Okay. Uh, we just had a designer actually that uh, was his, his contract was ended at USAA because he was too quiet. He couldn't interact with people. And the reason why that that in, impaired his work was is because he couldn't communicate with everyone on the team in order to gather the correct requirements, gather the correct information to understand the design that he was actually supposed to produce. Okay? That's on the front end. 
On the back end, what it, what it did for him is, or how it hindered him was, is when he presented his work, he now has to explain and defend his work, right? So he has to explain why he came up with the design that he had, uh, what was the story behind it, and then as he gets challenged, because naturally it's not, you're not going to present something to someone and say, hey, that's the coolest thing I think I've ever seen. Let's go ahead and run with it. You know, they're going to challenge certain things. Why did you do this? Why did you use this color? Why did you use this spicing? What if we used diff different fonts? What if we did this? You know, you need to be able to defend that as you go. So a couple things on this is, is number one is this technology, as we had the iPads, technology doesn't do the work for you. You've got to be prepared. You have to make sure that you go to the portfolio presentation prepared. Uh, you know, prepare some samples for each meeting. Make sure it's custom for each person. Make sure that you're not just, it's not kind of like a routine that you go through and you're just like, hey, you know, and you're just kind of going through it. Put your best foot, uh, best work first and then keep things organized, okay? So, um, focus on making a connection with the interviewer and practice going through your samples, okay? You want to make sure that this is, we talked about a story before, but one of the things that you want to talk about if you're ta telling a story is you want to tell them about what the problem was. You want to tell them what the solution was, and then you want to be able to present, present to them what the results of the solution was and how it had to impact on the problem. And so, you know, if you keep things in your portfolio review <coughs> to that type of a story, it tends to carry a little bit more weight and it tends to carry a little bit more impact with them, especially if you think about it. You know, you've got things that is just neat, organized, you've got your bet pieces, and then you're engaged with them, you know, a rig a rig around customized things. So other things that you want to do, so you want to basically have a top five pitch. You know, what do you think I mean by top five pitch? Similar to the 11 second elevator pitch? Similar, yes. Okay, so what would be your top, if you were to quickly write them off, I mean, what do you think would be your top five projects or top five portfolio pieces? Well, each one where I solve the problem and mm -hmm. set Generate a either a revenue return or a more efficient return for, right. for, for what I was doing. Okay, and that's the whole thing. We want to make sure if we have a short amount of time that you want to go through this. So you want to make sure that if you're going to be able to give that pres presentation, you may not go through all five. And I would imagine you probably wouldn't go through all five. But if you have five there, you can actually customize things as the conversation goes. You can tell them, you know, this one, you know, this one. But at least you have five that you've rehearsed that you know that you can go through and then you can quickly uh, you can quickly run through it. So that's actually the presentation. So um, I guess initial questions and then what we can do is we can actually there's there's five, six of us, so we can actually go through um, portfolios one on one, we can rotate. Uh, but uh, first off, any questions? Yes? If you're an interaction designer, or that's sort of the position you're interviewing for, and your work isn't visually pretty, like like wireframes aren't necessarily pretty or inviting to look at, how would you recommend using that? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you, no. all right. So one of the things that you want to do with interactive design, particularly understanding that low fidelity wireframes are often the thing that you do to get to showing an interactive. Here again, it's still telling the story. So even if you're looking at low fidelity and you may not have a finished product yet, what you want to explain is what the problem is that you are trying to solve. Um, and the more complex the problem, obviously, the more difficult to solve. And you want to walk the person through, here again, that thought process. What was the problem you were trying to solve? What you were doing through your interaction design to move to solve that problem? Um, I get. In particular, in enterprise, we run into this a lot. Um, a design, a, a software package, for example, will have complaints from users too many clicks, which is usually not really the problem, but that's what the customer will often say. So you want to show in your interaction design what you did to help reduce that. Did that mean you showed different content at a different a different point? Um, and talk about what you did, and then you may not have a finished product yet, but you can say, and we usability tested this, 
and this is what we learned. So even if you don't have that detail, you can still talk about it as a part of that process to getting to an updated software perspective. And, well, and I mean, just 100%, yes. Um, we met with a client that we work with from time to time who's actually one of the sponsors for this too, and they told us that they don't want to see PDFs. Even if it's not pretty work, they want it to be interactive. So whether it's clickable wireframes or however you can showcase that, they want to be able to interact with that themselves, even if it's not the visual piece of it or a finished product. So there needs to be some kind of interaction with it if you are an interactive designer. So I so if you have extra files, if you, I've even seen people present wireframes that have been put into PowerPoint, believe it or not, mm -hmm. because you see what those fruit yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. So anything that can show what those interaction pieces are, that's great. I mean, keep in mind, you're, 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 the audience that you have, you know, it's, the interaction designer is not going to be showing a portfolio in comparison to a Creative. mobile, you know, visual designer. They're, I mean, so if, if you're looking at an interaction designer, they're, they're looking at similar types of portfolios, and, and what they're looking for is the mindset behind why you laid things out, because that's why they're built by wireframe in the first place. Mm -hmm. So. And the same holds true with interaction design a lot. I mean, uh, information architecture. Mm -hmm. So even if you are working at designing how the information is going to be presented, and you may want to just show a chunk of navigation and talk about why the navigation was designed in that particular way. Why is it horizontal and not vertical? Why is it vertical and not horizontal? Uh, to talk about the presentation of information and the use of taxonomy. If you can talk about those things intelligently, the fact that it's black and white and not a finished product, I want to hear what you're thinking. Because that to me is infinitely more important than that finished thing. Any other questions? Yes? Um, what do you find to be like, the best way to display a whole website on your own portfolio? Like, take actually some cool things you can where people take a gift and they still do, you know, a longer cost for each, you know, slide, but I don't know, sometimes it seems like it's easier to send them to the website than they're not on your website or your portfolio website anymore, so do you have any kind of best practices on that? One thing you can do, um, and I would highly recommend for doing something like that, is show a screenshot, screen caption before and after, and what you did and what you improved from the before to the after. Um, and then I've also used uh, the sliding capability. So you basically create a slide show, if you will, of the story behind why it was created, who was it created for, show them before, and then show them now. How many pages do you think is sufficient? Because websites can be so big. Five to seven. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing, five to seven. And, and the other piece of that, particularly with a website where there's a lot of content, what you want to talk about is who is the user and what you expect them to do when they get there. So you can take the home page if your expectation is that they are going to come into the home page. You may say 80% of our users search for X, they come to us from Google or Bing or whatever, so they're not even going to the home page so much, which means those inside pages take a certain amount of criticality. And you can respond to that through web analytics. You can say, this is how they're coming to the site, and show, and then, you, know, you may want to show the home page to set context, but you can also address the fact that 80% you know, of our users do searches, so they come to this page or a similar page, depending on what they're looking to do. And a typical user is, and talk about who the audience is. You know, it's moms looking for um, customizing diaper um, covers. For mom. I kid you not, this exists. It does. Okay. It does because a friend of mine went and did all this because when she had her baby and she didn't want, she wanted cloth diapers, and they customized cloth diaper covers. And don't ask. Anyway, but let's say you design something like that. Um, here again, they may not have come into the home page. They may have come into another page and launched right into that process. And you only need to show four or five pages of that process. Um, you define your audience, what they came there to do, and show the process that you designed to move them through. And, and in addition to that, it's 
It's about the design, but it's also about the call to action. Mm -hmm. So your the sub pages of your site should be cohesively a part of the home page overall look and feel. Yep. So that initial page, and then more about the call to action and what that user was trying to do, especially when it comes into user experience, in addition to the visual piece. And it and that content of being able to sell your story, it's like problem, audience, solution. Just real short and sweet. So and then it's like the carrot that, I don't know if you were in here earlier, but Shirley was talking about dangling that carrot. Leave them wanting more so when you get that interview, they can ask you, okay, well tell me more about this audience. Or tell me more about how you got to that solution. Don't say everything in the portfolio or your resume. So, yeah, I was gonna say, like a lot of us, uh, I was gonna say, have more than one target user yeah or pick a sweet spot look at the you know look at what had the highest conversion or, or whatever or the best analytics and pick that or like what Swam was saying tailor it to the audience or the job that you're trying to get if you're going to be talking to pampers we'll pick that mom audience if you're going to be talking to a technology company pick that you know go that way and, and the one thing is, is I think we all have to realize and understand is, is that websites have a purpose, right? You know, I, I met with one company, and they, and it was a small company, Austin, a startup company, and you know we took a look at his website, and we were talking about the website, and he was explaining how much money he had spent in this website. You know, he spent, I think he said somewhere around two hundred, two hundred ten, two hundred fifty thousand dollars on this website. You know, and, and he's trying to sell uh, this new type of innovative. Uh, Data uh, blades, you know. And so instead of cooling them in the air, like on the knot center, they would basically cool them in oil. See how that worked for them? You know, I don't know. Um, but in any case, uh, so I asked him, like, so just out of curiosity, how, how's how's the you know website going? He's like, um, I don't think it's working very well. And I said, why do you think that? And he said, because of the, the year that it's been up, we have not generated one sale off the website. Uh, and he goes, we have generated two leads and no sales. Okay, so, so, so your return on your investment is your $250,000 in all. You've generated two leads and no sales. <laughs> so, you know, and lo and behold, what it came out to be is, is that, you know, the person who was designing a site was not a B2B type of a designer. You know, this person was more of a, you know, kind of an informative type of, uh, you know, and that's how he designed the site. He wasn't designing the site for the purpose of generating lead capture, lead gen, you know, things like that. So we have to think about what is the purpose of the site. So when you think about the sites that you want to portray on your portfolio, make sure that you can pick the one where you can demonstrate the biggest understanding and improvement of the purpose of the site. So if it's a nonprofit, you know, but at the same time, the purpose of the site is to increase membership. We want to be able to show an analytics that increases membership. If the purpose of the site is to increase, uh, say for example, conversions, uh, is this e-commerce or shopping cart, we want to be able to show increased time, conversions, maybe increased dollars, revenues, things like that. But as long as you can pick the pieces out, you don't have to display the entire site. You know, we built a customized uh, site for for United Healthcare for their customer service department that decreased call time by 60%. I don't need to show them the whole site, partially one because we can't, because it's a proprietary site, you know, but all I have to do is show a screenshot of it and explain to them that we decreased call times by 60%. Okay, now from there, they just want to know more. How did you do it? Where did you take it from? What was, you know, how did you, uh, you know, uh, accomplish that, that type of thing. So that's the same thing you would want to do on your sites. One more thing, well, two more things to add to that too is, as Suwon mentioned, analytics is really big. Um, but the second thing too is testimonials. If this can actually speak and talk for you, and you're not talking for yourself, that adds to the problems. So if the client has a testimonial, definitely put it on. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> I'm going to throw out a question for you. So I brought up the point of proprietary. Okay. So what are you guys' thoughts of if you have worked either one of two places uh, or one or two, most of your work is either number one, 
held under some sort of an NDA, or uh, basically you cannot show the piece of work, or the piece of work, most of the pieces, the good pieces in your portfolio are mostly for proprietary. In other words, you can't actually share them. Um, what are you guys' thoughts on how you overcome that with the portfolio? What I've done is I've actually gone to that client that I have an NDA with, mm -hmm. and I see if there are pieces I can use locally. And what I mean by locally, as we all know, not online, right? And then I put on my site that I can show this per request where I have to actually see them in person and they can see it locally on my machine. I know it sounds kind of silly and old, but I actually do have a portfolio that I carry around that includes some of those things, which I know isn't the digital thing, but quite frankly, since I've been doing enterprise for almost 20 years, the fact that I protect the proprietary nature of the work from my previous employer says a whole lot to the people that I'm going to work with. Because it means I can be trusted with things that are proprietary. And I have a few things, given the nature of my work, which is a whole lot of research, uh, user experience research and so forth, I don't have a lot in an online portfolio. Because for me, and the kind of work that I do, it's, it, I, it doesn't say a whole lot without the story. So I am one of those kind of old fashioned people that still carry through. Now it's a small, it's not like when I was a journalist and I was carrying full page articles and things, which is a really long time ago. But, but because of the nature of the work that I do and, and the fact that a lot of it has been for software that costs companies millions of dollars, uh, the proprietary issue is a big deal. But the fact that I will say to them, I'm, I'm happy to show you what I have that's not, and when we go to an interview situation, I'm happy to show you some sort of here. Oftentimes, my former clients are agreeable for me to share their company logo. Because it's out there, it's public, it's okay. And if it's a company logo that you recognize, that's going to grab the attention of somebody that I can then, I'm getting the meeting. That's the main purpose of this portfolio is to get a meeting and then I can share with them more. But having those logos are big too. Just develop your own work? Develop your own work so you can do it? Yeah, a lot of my, uh, some of my uh, contractors and stuff I've seen, they do um, password protected sites. So, but it is more back to what you were saying, was earlier where it's, you know, I can show you in person my goals locally, um, but they'll have a site created but it's just all password protected. And I think the other thing is, is, is getting back to the other piece of the uh, one, I can't remember what his name was, but um, he constantly works on his portfolio, so it's not like something where he wakes up one day and he's, he's like, oops, okay, I've got two years that I've got to pull up these pieces, you know, he just constantly does things kind of just for fun because he has passion about it and he loves it. And so if they're not tied to a company, but they are true design, you know, uh, we've had people literally, and, you know, uh, who've actually made entire projects of uh, non-existent resorts or non-existing companies, and they built websites, they built you know campaigns, they built everything you know, uh, brand uh, lateral everything around it, just so they could have pieces that are new, trendy, that are, are innovative, that aren't are never going to be held within the confines of you know of an NDA or any type of proprietary information. And I want, I want to add one thing that Shauna said too. Um, I've done this before. If you're working with an awesome CMS like WordPress, one thing I found effective is to take some of the work that I've done in the past and it actually will have portfolio stuff on it, and I'll dupe the code into a new page, and I'll password protect that, and make it and tailor it specifically <coughs> to the client that I'm going to try to get this position for, or this client for. Now you have something that's tailor fit specifically to that client itself. 